Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out in the weather. I know the roads are, some of you had to drive further. I almost didn't get out of the driveway driving it down because it was blown shut, but I got in and I thought, uh-oh, at one point I didn't think I was going to get out, um, but we did, so that's good. Um, we were also up in New York. We were supposed to be there from Thursday to Saturday, but and I actually checked the forecast on Wednesday, and they were calling for snow, but nothing, no major accumulation, and then... On uh, Thursday, we learned, Friday morning, we learned that they were calling for 6 to 12 or more up there, and high winds, and plus here, so we drove home Friday night. And disappointed, lost a day with the kids and our, our kids, our daughter and son-in-law and the, and the kids, but we had fun while we were there. So anyway, glad you're here, glad you're all safe. Um, someone said there was a 73-car pileup on 581 over in uh, Camp Hill, I guess it was Camp Hill, Mechanicsburg area, I always get, I don't know where the line is there. Um, Nobody was hurt. I don't know how you have 73 cars in an accident and nobody was hurt, but that's uh, very good news. Um, we stayed in yesterday. I'd bre I went after everything was done, went to Weiss one time. I think it's only a mile away, but uh, safe is a good thing, place to be. All right, so um, guys, you've announcements, are they, you guys have the announcements, just scroll them up there. I've said these so many times, you guys probably could tell me what's going on. Uh, I think the only thing we haven't talked about lately is the Be Still seminar that's coming up April 30th on a Saturday, which is a month and a half away yet. You're going to be hearing more, and we actually have a video for that. Is that ready to go, guys? Anita Marcassani is going to be coming. So if you want to play that video. Hi there. I am Dr. Anita Marcassani. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a licensed psychologist, uh, and I am the author of this book right here, Be Still. Sometimes only a specific, direct, intimate, supernatural word from God Almighty himself can solve your deepest emotional problems. God's, God's word tells us in 1 Kings that his voice is still and small. Yet when we have the equivalent of a hurricane or an earthquake going on in our minds day after day, just bombarded with so much stuff, it is impossible to hear God's voice to us and to allow him to minister to our hearts at the deepest level. I am hosting a very special women's event at Free Grace Church on April 30th, and I would love for you to come. It is perfect if you are at all interested in how this intersection of mental health issues and emotional struggles uh, coexists with the healing truth of Jesus Christ. While as Christians, we're promised victory over all life struggles, not all of them here in the natural, our ultimate victory won't be until we're with Jesus on the other side. But until then, he really does care about the status of your broken heart, and he stands ready to be able to minister to your heart. So come learn about how to do that by being still. So what we'll do is we'll dive into what God means when he says, be still. And here's a little spoiler alert. It doesn't mean what the world says when they tell you to be still. God has kind of a different definition of be still in the Psalm 4610 verse. And inside understanding that verse to be still and know that I am God, you can possibly achieve deep emotional healing. So I'd love to see you on April 30th. Make sure you sign up. I'll see you then. Good stuff. And by the way, sometimes you hear mental health and you say, I don't have any mental health issues. It's not just for people who have mental health issues. It's people who have stuff that's happened to you during your life, and we all have it. None of us get out of here without scars and wounds, right? We all, we all have them. And some of you try to hide them a little more than others, and, uh, but we all have them. And kids have them, adults have them. So please don't stay away from it because you're afraid that, uh, you know, what people will think or anything like that. She's actually a, a personal friend of Sue and mine. Uh, we know her. We've known her for some years. She lives in New York. Um, but she's, it's just an amazing ministry she has where she was a psychologist. Before, you know, that's what she went to school for. That's what she did. Then she became a Christian. And God has been using her in healing and helping people walk through healing processes because he didn't just say, hey, you can't be a psychologist anymore. He took what she knew 
and she used it now she and she says and, and married what she learned uh, with with what the Bible says and it's just really amazing and every time I hear her talk about it I learn from it and I gain something from it so don't sit there and think well I don't have any mental health it's not just for somebody who has a breakdown or, or, you know, mental health issues and you're on medication. This is for everybody. I always tell her it shouldn't just be for ladies, but she doesn't listen to me in that area. So guys need to learn to be still too. Um, so it's just really good stuff. So anyway, you saw stuff up there about game night in a couple weeks. Missionary is going to be with us next week. Um, so hope you can join us for that. The game night should be some fun stuff going on, and uh, hope, that's just something we all need to do and laugh. We all need to laugh more than we probably do. All right, let's uh, stand up, pray, get ready to sing and worship together, and we'll open, a word, we'll open here in a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the beautiful snow, and sometimes we need things like that to be still, to stop us and shut us down a little bit, uh, but uh, it's something we need to learn to practice all the time. But in this time... <laughs> Even while we're worshiping you, Lord, let our hearts just be still in you and listening to you for that small voice, that still small voice that Anita talked about, uh, because you love to talk to us and communicate with us, and we just need to hear you. So do, please do that through the word, through the music. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. a setting like this on a Sunday morning, and we welcome all of you who are online this morning to join us as we worship. Um, this morning's worship time, I'm just going to invite you to, along with inviting the Holy Spirit to be with us, to imagine yourself in that place of just quietly this morning being still before the Lord, and uh, I didn't realize that we were going to have this little presentation about being still before the Lord, but my heart's been drawn all week to being still and absorbing being in the presence of Jesus, just being in his presence, that quiet place that he invites us to, because he's the firm foundation of our life. He is the one who firmly solidifies our walk and all of those things we walk through in life he is our firm foundation so as we open in worship we're going to sing that powerful hymn how firm a foundation is he in our lives and um, and then we're going to be just taking into uh, that time where we're going to just be in the quietness of his presence this morning so would you join me as we sing together how firm a foundation is Jesus our Lord <clears throat>
the words to that hymn. They are so solid. They are so founding. Nothing can shake. Nothing can shake the rock that we stand on. I'm going to need the words on the back. Um, I want to read from Psalms 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Is there any greater place we can be than at that place of refuge with Jesus? Near to his heart, drawing close to him. That's where we want to be this morning in our worship together. And we're going to sing that beautiful hymn, Near to the Heart of God. There is a place of quiet rest. <clears throat> there is. wonderful place to be near to the heart of God. Jesus, this morning, that's where we want to be. Draw us close to you.
Could I have all the little ones, the young at heart, anyone who just wants to have fun today, come on up. Thanks. 
Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Good? Good. So, <laughs> what <laughs> holiday is coming up? <laughs> Olivia? St. Patrick's Day. The yes, St. Patrick's Day. And what goes along with St. Patrick's Day? Green. Um, green. green and clovers. Green and clovers. And last year, we learned about the shamrock, right? Do you remember that? I do, and I found it very difficult to top that children's moment today. But we're going to learn about the color green. Ooh, I like green. Do you? Yes. It's no? I like purple. You like purple? Did you know it's not good to be green? No. I like being green. Do you? Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully after today, you change your mind. I won't because okay. green and blue are my favorite Mommy, colors. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Blue six what? Me, I, I got a um I got I had a leprechaun in my house once and, and I still That's have nice. those muddy footprints on my carpet. I'm gonna try and test that one this year. Okay. I'm gonna so try and Lucky Charms has leprechaun houses and hotels. You cut them out and you can trap your own leprechaun. Fun fact. Okay. I'm gonna do it. So do it. I want to catch a leopard too. So, have you ever heard the saying, you're green with envy? No. no. This is where green's bad, okay? So, do you know what envy means? No. No. Like madness? No. That's no. Like what? Madness. Madness? No. Not, it could get madness, but not quite. So, who likes this guy? I do. I do. I do. I do. Okay. So what if I told you these are mine, they're brand new, and I told you how great these things were? What would you think? Yeah. They're pretty cool, right? Yeah. How much I love how it's totally no. a little one. You'd think they're cool if they had dinosaurs on. Okay. I do not Imagine like one with dinosaurs, Bobby. What happens when you like so much that you want it? That's envy. When somebody has something that you want so bad. You got to ask and use your manners. Uh, well, you're not getting my baby Yoda spatulas. Baby no matter how cute you, like and mannerful you are. My sister has lots of baby Yodas and my mom hid it because she So, gets... being envious of something or someone means you are wishing you had what they had. And sometimes it gets really, really bad. And in Proverbs 1430, 1340? No, 1430. <laughs> it says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. This is where green is bad, okay? So, we have a demonstration today. Who loves whip topping? Me. I am right there with everybody. I love whip topping. It is, you know, some, ta is some days I could just me? literally sit here and eat it right out of the container, right? It smells good. Well, it it's whip topping. Good. Of course it smells good. It looks like whipped cream. It looks like whipped cream. Okay. So, this is us. Yeah. We are happy. Happy. We're joyful. We're peaceful. We are living That's life. Shh. We are living life. <laughs> Following God's word, we're loving everybody, we're being nice, our words are loving. But then our friend gets a new toy. Hold on. Our friend gets a new toy. And you know, it's like top of the line toy. And at first we're really happy, right? At first we're, we're excited because we figure if we use our manners, we're going to be able to play with that toy too. But the more we get to share that toy, the more we're just like, you know, I really, oh I, I, I really, no, no. No. I really like that toy. I really want that toy. And our lives go from that awesome white to a green. Can I please stir it? Hold on. Okay. And can then, I can, I, can I stir it now? Okay, everybody take a turn stirring. Okay, can that's I, a stir. Can I? That, that's a stir. Okay. And the more that we want to stir, or the more that we want to play with that toy, Hi. our words stop being loving and they turn to mean. Are you listening? 
Yes. Yeah, I am. Our words stop being loving and they turn hurtful because now instead of playing nice with our friend and their new toy, we're maybe hoarding it like this and telling them, nope, you can't have a turn. You, nope, this is mine. But it's really not ours, is it? And that's not nice. So that's where envy and being green can be hurtful. And it's not at all how we're supposed to live, is it? No. But it no. smells like cotton candy. But the green smells like cotton candy. Let me smell. I don't know that it smells like cotton candy. Let me smell. Let me smell. Let me smell. Let me smell. Okay, no. I don't. I don't so, smell. being green with envy is good or bad? Bad. 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 Because bad. when we're envious, we are not being nice, loving, joyful, right? We're being mean, and we're not shining like the disco ball, like we need to. You two are wearing green balls. We, hey, we had a disco ins- ball right there one day. Yes, I we like did. That. Instead, we're being hurtful <laughs> and <laughs> kind of showing people how Jesus doesn't want us to live, right? Right? Bobby, I, I need... I've lost them. I need you. Okay? They're gone. They're <laughs> I have lost the attention, and now I've lost your attention. I'm only... I'm only okay. I'm listening to you. So, like next that. time we think about St. Pat, Patrick's Day or think about wearing green, hopefully we will remember this awesome demonstration of how being jealous or wanting something somebody else has can turn us into a bad color. Okay? Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son. And Lord, we know that there's going to be fun toys that our friends will get and we will not. So help us remember to stay joyful and to shine your love when those situations happen. Help us to not be envious or to covet what others have that we don't. Help us to, no matter what the situation is, know that your gift that is waiting for us is far greater than that toy or that new electronics. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good job. Well, envy is definitely a good word, and it actually fits with what I'm going to talk about, which is unity, because where there's envy, there's not unity. Right. And I used to, she's sitting there thinking about things like kids, games. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I, I always rode older motorcycles, never had a new one. And, and I know people that would get a new one and I would be like, boy, I kind of wish I could have a new one. And, um, but I was, con- I, I learned to be content and it was okay. Um, but you, we do have to battle through that with, you know, in life people, you know, what, what's going on and what people can do and what I might not be able to do and what they can do. And, and sometimes there's envy even not for stuff. It's envy just that you might have a household that's peaceful and someone else might have a household where the kids just rule the roost and stuff. And, and people might look and say, well, I wish my house could be that peaceful. So the envy isn't just about things. It, it, it's, and sometimes people think if I have less stuff, then I'm going to be in more, I might be in a position to be, deal with envy more, but that's not necessarily the case. Envy can creep up in many ways. Um, so what we're talking about today is unity. I was supposed to talk and start a four-week thing on, on our, our mission statement that we've adapt, we've, we're have we working on and, and coming, but I'm going to wait because I can't do it four weeks in a row, and I want to do these four weeks in a row, because next week we have missionaries, and we have Easter Sunday, and uh, coming up in that somewhere in that mix too. So I just didn't want to. This all we'll wait till after Easter, and then we'll get a four week shot, and then go right at it. And so I, I literally spent Monday and Tuesday all day, just studying and and on on this first part of our mission. And so then we we had our board meeting, and we got talking about it, and realized you know it's probably not a good thing to start. So Wednesday I come in, and I, I just spent the day like, okay, if I'm not going to teach on that. What am I going to teach on? Because I hadn't really thought about it. And I spent the day and I started getting a little stressed because we were leaving for New York Thursday uh, that I might not have something. And it wasn't until later in the day that I thought unity is a really good thing. Because remember, we talked about the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we talked about above all else, guard your heart, the scripture, above all else, you know, and really, really paying attention to the fact that you have a heart, not, not this thing that's beating inside your chest, 
but the, your spirit in a sense, so the core of who you really are. When you pass away, we go to a funeral, there is a body that was a tent where you were housed while you were alive. Uh, but as soon as you pass away, you know, someone passes away, they immediately either go to hell or heaven. <laughs> Just, that's what it said. That, that's what we know. And so it's that in, inner who you really are. Um, guard that because out of it flows the wellsprings of life. I mean, it's, it's really critical. Last week, I spoke a, a tough message, but something we all need to hear, and that was about offenses. And my title was Defense Against Offense, not a game, not like a baseball pitching, you know, the pitcher, the, you know, the defense against the batter or the offense or football. You have, you know, you have two sides of the ball. Um, it's, it's not that. It was literally trying to learn and know, because Luke chapter 17 said very clearly, Jesus' words, it is impossible for no offenses to come. They're going to come. Basically, he said, they're going to come. Be ready. But, you know, just like he said in John 16, 33, you know, in this world you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He tells us you're going to have trouble, but then he says, don't worry about it because I've already overcome it. So if offenses come, he's already overcome that too. We also look back at the story of uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 10, um, David had, you know, there was a king in a different country that, that was very good and kind to David. And when he passed away, David said, I'm going to send servants to him. And I'm sorry, I didn't look at the names today to remember the names. Um, but David sent servants. You can read it if you didn't hear this last week, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. Um, sent servants to comfort the son who is now going to be the king. And, of course, the counselors, you know, around the king said, surely David's not coming here to comfort you. He's coming here to spy out the land. And he listened to those guys, and, and they took the servants of David and shaved their beards and then cut out the buttocks area of their clothing, the tunics and stuff. Very, hum very embarrassing, very offensive. I mean, when you think about getting hurt and wounded and having to deal with that, um, they had to deal with that, but... Very interesting, as they were coming back and David heard about that, David went out and he was like, go to Jericho and wait until your beards grow back. So I use that, you know, in talking in a sense that offenses come and sometimes we need to step away or go someplace, maybe not physically, maybe it's in your bedroom or your quiet place in your house, but it's to go somewhere when the offense does come or the opportunity for offense to come and deal with it inside, protecting and guarding your heart to not carry that, to not take it on, um, but to deal with it and, and, and let that, you know, let, let things, let God heal you. And if any vengeance is needed, God dealt with the vengeance on his own. David did in that story, but God is the, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So God takes care of that. We have a tendency of wanting to avenge ourselves for ourselves, and that's not our job and it's not our role. So as I was going through the day, panicking a little bit, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to be up, and the kids are going to be there, and I'm not going to have a lot of time and quiet and peace. Um, and, and I got into this unity, and I started just looking at the Word and the definition of the Word and looking at Scriptures, and, and I realized this is it, because if we aren't guarding our heart and we're allowing offenses to come in, then we're not going to have unity in our church, and not just in this building, but also even with other Christians. We're just not. We, and that's what we, we've got to learn to get past. And I'll probably say this again. I think it's in my notes somewhere. Unity doesn't mean we agree on everything. I, I want you to hear that clearly. There's going to be some things that I might say sometime that you might say, well, that's not how I see it. Or you might read a book by an author, and, and, I've, and I think every book I've ever read, I found something. I, eh, I'm not sure I'd line up exactly with what he's saying there, but you know, 99% of it's great. Um, you know, I, I've been in groups of people, pastors, uh, uh, there were, gosh, just in our group in York, um, there were a lot of Baptist pastors, Pentecostal that came out of Assembly of God and other type Pentecostal churches. There were, um, independent, non-denominational, uh, there were Methodists. We had a lot, there was, I mean, but we all gathered together and laid down our differences in a sense, 
Um, I think, Gail, it was you on, you said something about celebrate each other's differences. But somehow when we were praying on Wednesday night, we, we learned that differences are okay, and it's okay that I don't agree with you on everything. So I'm, I, wanna, I want you to hear that up front. Agreement doesn't mean, or unity doesn't mean that we're going to agree on everything. Right. That's just there's just and, and even an interpretation. And one of the first scriptures I'm going to read here is actually I, I didn't even put it in here um, because I've always read it in, and learned it originally in King James, where it says uh, uh, in Acts chapter two that, the, you know, just before the, the Holy Spirit fell, it says that they were all in the same place. In, and in the King James, the new King James, it says in one accord. Um, and they're not talking about a Honda. <laughs> so they're. Uh, wow, you guys. Wow, thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, I got to do something to make you laugh a little bit. One accord, but there are some of the, some passages don't have that in it. They don't have that part about being in one accord. So I thought, well, I'm not going to dive into that deep today to see if it's supposed to be there or not. Um, but the fact that they were in one place and they were waiting as Jesus told them to wait, and we have to believe they were in one accord. Um, but that's, that's a, something that we have to think about. We have to get to that place and once again, laying down sometimes our pettiness. And there is a lot of pettiness in the church world, a lot of pettiness. And there are people that won't even deal with other churches or do anything with another church because of some of the differences. Well, they believe. But you know what? 95 to 98 percent of what they believe is probably the same thing you believe. And they have some differences. Yeah, and maybe they pray different. Maybe they worship different in the sense of their service. But if their heart is following after God... There are brothers and sisters, and we need to get along. You know, can't we all just get along? And you know, you hear people say that sometimes, and there's, that's something that we have to learn, and we have to do well. So unity is interesting, because everyone thinks, how can we all be united? Um, we have the United States of America. Uh, we're not very united in a lot of ways. Even before this last year or so, there's always been differences. We're 50 states, and the 50 states can be, are governed differently. There are commonwealths. I shouldn't even say 50 states. I mean, we're a commonwealth. Some of the states are commonwealths. Some, you know, and they're, they're just different ways that we do things because people are like, well, I like doing it this way. I like doing it that way. Some of you like paper, you know, like you like filing systems, and you want paper, and you like writing a check because you got a piece of paper. I don't like anything to do with paper. I do everything electronic, and the less paper, to, and I'm not a tree hugger because trees are a renewable resource, so it's nothing. I just don't, I'm not organized and structured, and I don't like it. So that's just a difference, right? But we can still be one. We can still be in unity, even though that, that's not a, a great example, but it's just we're, we're different. We do things differently, and that's all okay. So we do need to get along. So here's just a definition I pulled out of, went back into Webster's 1828 dictionary and just pulled little pieces of the dictionary or the definition out because it's really long. Uh, and it says in there, the quality or state of not being multiple. And then it says oneness, being one. A condition of harmony, accord, co uh, continuity without deviation or change as in purpose or action. So there's just, there's just a little bit you know, of what that word, you know, oneness, accord, being in one accord um, uh, without deviating from who we are and, and, and things like that. So that's, that's part of it. So, but I want to say this too, first and foremost, in light of unity, um, our unity with other believers depends on our unity with Christ. So if that is a true statement, which I just said, and I think it's pretty obvious, you know, I, I always like the cross in the sense that the, the vertical beam, to me, kind of represents our relationship with the Lord. And the horizontal beam, is a, it, it comes out of that relationship and, and then spreads horizontally to where I am. My neighbors, my family, my friends, anyone I come in contact with. I, I, that's how I tend to think about that. So if it's, if, it's, excuse me, if it's a true statement that our unity with other believers depends on our unity with Christ, if we have disunity with brothers and sisters in Christ, then maybe we got a problem vertically too. Maybe our relationship isn't where it's supposed to be. And, and you know, when you read your Bible, it's a mirror. <laughs> and there's times that you read the Bible and you pick up things and something comes out and, and, and the Lord will speak to you right directly through that and say, that's something you need to work on. That's, you know, it happens when you deal with kids. Anyone ever, when you raise your kids, you ever talking to the kids, and while you're telling your kids something, you feel this little tap on the shoulder? 
One of the best ways I ever heard the Lord speak. Well, you sh and when I, I was literally talking to the kids and say, wait a minute, I'm talking to my kids. Wait, hang on. <laughs> because he's telling me, you need to listen to what you're saying to your kids because that's what I've been trying to say to you. That's what happens in the word when we read it and we have this relationship with the Lord. He talks to us and he talks to us where we're at and, and what we're doing. And it's important. So our unity with each other depends on our unity with him. So if we have any disunity, and, and, and when I spoke on offenses last week, I really hope you took it to heart and you searched your heart and you said, is there any offense in me? Is there anything? And to make that right and to get that, get, you know, get that stuff out of your heart and, and get pure because that's, that's, that's what we need, purified hearts. And, you know, this, this whole unity thing, we're not just left to our, ourself. We're, we're given the Holy Spirit and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is what makes me able, to, you know, to be one that makes me one with the Father and the Son. And, the whole, you know, I'm one with God gives me the ability to be one with you as well and us with each other. That's what happens. We have this Holy Spirit to do this. We're not alone. It's an amazing union, and it is the basis for all other relationships. Once that vertical relationship is correctly aligned, you know what I mean? When it, 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 when it is that, it's right. And I've I'm, I'm, I'm got this loving God, and I'm, and I'm growing in that. When that's happening, I can begin to love those around me deeply and authentically. Because there's a lot of people that will say, I love you, because it's just easy to say. It's not really easy when you know what it really means. You know, some of you are like, uh, love you. I'm not even sure I like you. You know, that, that's the thought sometimes. But love, it's, it's, it's when we get, like I said, this relationship with the Lord right, then this other stuff, it just starts coming into line because God deals with me. And if I have issues with somebody, he deals with me so that I can walk in unity with that person. Our unity is not based on culture. <laughs> personal cultures, interests, or personal tastes. I mean, gosh, we all have different tastes. All we have to do is walk into each of your homes and see color schemes and, and furniture and, and, and whatever, you know what I mean, and the way you dress. Um, everything's different, and we don't all have to do it the same way. That's not what unity is. It's something much deeper and much more profound. It's not trying to think how to say this best it's not what we have in common that matters what we have in common it's who we have in common isn't that the key the key is who we have in common and who do we all have in common you know it's interesting you know jesus i'll answer that just in case you were wondering i don't want to leave you hanging there um it's really interesting in the world um certain things in culture get you in certain places and gets you accepted in what, you know, and, and it happens. Uh, the military, um, the military goes, you know, causes people the way they structure things. And I literally just watched in the last couple weeks, uh, Sue actually watched it with me. Uh, uh, they followed a, a Navy SEAL team from the beginning of BUDS. If you're not familiar with it, the first six months of, to become a Navy SEAL, it's literally six months of training. And it's, it's practically hell on earth. I mean, it's, it's the most, it is the toughest training. And I've read books, Navy SEALs, and, and I've heard some, but this one they literally followed an actual group. Started with 88, only 16 graduated. And that's fairly normal because uh, it's that hard. But one of the, and, and boot camp, they, if you go to boot camp, you don't get booted. <laughs> you, you don't get booted out of boot camp. You have to make it through. You, can, you might wash you back, and that happens in the Navy SEAL sometime, but you're not out. You know, you, you still have to go through it. But one of the things that they do so well is they teach authority and they teach respect. And they, and they take you to a place where they almost break you. But there's a purpose behind it. And that's one of the things that was so good about the documentary we watched was they said, we don't want to break their spirit. We just want to get them to the place that they're teachable and that they can operate as one. And the whole theme behind becoming a Navy SEAL is that you are not important. We are important. That's not the verbiage, but that's, that's what I get. It's all about the team. It's all about your partner and that you're together and you never leave anybody behind. And it's all that stuff. And it's so good. And I like that. Uh, another example, having a Harley Davidson. You have a Harley Davidson, and I've had a couple, um, 
you can go places and you can communicate with people that are from all different walks. You know, the, the stereotypical biker dude, as opposed to a guy in a suit and tie ride and it's hardly to work. You, it's just, there's a common bond you have and you're accepted because you're on a Harley Davidson. It happens, in, and I'm just using examples from my life. You can go places, and someone will start talking to you and say, like, what is it? Oh, you, oh it's because I've already, oh, okay. You know, and, it, it's an, it's, and it's fun. It's a good thing. It's not bad. But the most important thing isn't about these things. It's about who. And one of the coolest things about being a Christian is you can go anywhere in the world. And I've been to Sweden three different times. And when I went, I was in Stockholm, and I ministered to Eritrean people. Eritrea used to be a part of Ethiopia. Um, Eritrea, I'm, I'm saying it, they say it more like Eritrea. Eritrea, most people here call it. Used to be part of Ethiopia, so they're basically the Ethiopians. And Sam, I've ministered in Ethiopian, uh, Eritrean church as well as Ethiopian. Sue went with me one time, but even though some of the people couldn't speak our language, there's something, and in any of you that have gone on mission trips, it's, it's a, it's, it stinks when you have somebody that you can't talk to because it's a, a, a a language barrier, but there's something that's still sweet about them, that there's this common bond that is better and bigger than a Harley Davidson, you know, group or groups. And, and those things are fun and they're okay, but there's nothing that's greater than this relationship we have with the Lord. And we get to share that. And it's a, it's a shame. It's very sad that a lot of other things get messed up and cause disunity among that group. I've been in Mexico. I wish I could speak Spanish. I learned how to say things like, where's the bathroom? And uh, a couple of different things, just, you know, in case I was separated from somebody. I actually went to town with a guy who didn't speak any English at all. And he had two guys in a truck. We had to go to this hardware store in town. And we had to get something. And we couldn't communicate too well. But we tried. We tried. And I saw a bumper sticker uh, on a car. A guy pulls in a bumper sticker. And it's a St. Louis Cardinals bumper sticker. Baseball team, right? And it was funny. I said, oh, St. Louis Cardinals. He said, ah, oh, St. Louis Cardinales. I'm not saying that as good as he did or as good as anyone here is Spanish. But it was just funny. We would find certain things that were just fun. But, but there was something that, that this guy and I had this bond, even though we couldn't really communicate well, real well because he was working at the orphanage. Uh, and, and, I mean, full time there. And I'm just going down to help. And we just had this bond because of Jesus. And, and a lot of you have experienced that. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, different language, different this, different that, maybe some different beliefs in some aspects that don't affect your salvation. Uh, just, it's, it's just an amazing place to get to, who we have in common. Sometimes Jesus will be all that connects us. Like I said, that was all we had. We couldn't talk much beyond that. But anyway, that, the good thing about only Jesus is what connects us. That's lasts in eternity. That's the most important thing we can have. There are a thousand ways to splinter a church, but there's only one way to bring it together. That's Jesus. There's lots of whispers, and I talked a little, hit that, just touched on a little bit last week, you know, sowing seeds of discord, and I, I talked about how we look at abominations, and sometimes we, we pick certain sins and we make them abominations, but sowing seeds of discord, and sowing seeds of discord is you going to somebody and talking negatively about someone else in the church. I don't like the way Joe preaches. I don't like the way Trudy leads. I don't like the way so-and-so dresses. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like hymns or choruses or vice versa. All kinds of things that we all have our, these opinions on. But when you start talking in a negative way to other people, you can be sowing seeds of discord. And sometimes you don't even realize it. It's an abomination to God. Sin is an abomination to God. It's important for us to not have sin in our life and to let it get in the way. And I said this kind of earlier, but here is it in my notes. We don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand. But we must be walking the same path and headed in the same direction. Sue and I don't agree on everything. And you, you can't even act shocked on that because you're like, <laughs> that's the truth. We don't. And it's okay. And some things in life in 30, almost 30, what are we at? 30, we're in our 36th year of being married. There are some things that I've learned that her way is better, and I acquiesce to that way. And there's things, hopefully there's some things that she learned that I do better, probably not as many, but um, that she can, you know, swing my way and say, yeah, I think that is better. And sometimes we just know because the way we handle things, even in meetings, we have these little signals. We used to, 
<laughs> she, every once in a while, she, has, she can get a little intense sometimes. You don't, you, a lot of you guys don't get to see that, but there were times that I would just reach over and just put my hand on her leg. And that was just signal you're getting a little intense. And, and she, I don't think you ever kicked me. Maybe you did. But there are little signals that are underneath that nobody sees. We don't agree on everything, but yet we've walked hand in hand together in life, headed in the same direction, right? And, and it doesn't get in the way. It's okay. This, we don't have this one for your screen. I, I have this in here this morning. Romans 14, 1, Paul encourages us to accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. I think we could just take the part weak out of there and just say, accept the, the one whose faith is weak or strong or whatever without quarreling over disputable matters because there are matters. There are some things that people dispute, you know? There's Calvinism versus Arminianism. You know, Calvinism believes in eternal security, that one saved, always saved. Arminianism, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure I say that. Arminianism, you know, doesn't believe that. that it's not, a, you know, that this walk that you have to continue to walk it out, that you can lose your salvation. You can, and it's not a matter of losing it because it's not, losing it's not the right way, but you can walk out of it. You know, you've walked into a relationship with the Lord and you can turn your back and walk away from God if you so choose. A true Calvinist would say you can't, if you were truly, they would say if you ever did that, you weren't really truly saved. So, but there's, but I have friends who believe Calvinistically. We don't, we're Armin, Arminius. Armini, I'm not saying it right. We, you got it. You know what I'm saying. But I have friends who believe that and we get along incredibly well. We just don't, we just choose to not go to that disputable matter. That's, I, I can't say we, we would never talk about it because I like sometimes saying to somebody, hey, I, I'd like to understand where you get that from because when I read this scripture, I, that seems to shoot that down. And I've had discussions with people like that. And that's good. It's good to talk to and learn from people. But, it, but you don't dispute it. Just talk. All right. Well, a unified church brings glory to Jesus. And when Jesus is glorified, the world will sit up and take notice. And that's maybe one of the biggest things that I've been saying, you know, years ago. And I think I said this at least one time in church on a Sunday morning. I know I've said it on a Wednesday night that somebody used this illustration kind of like somebody looking in the windows of a church. What are they seeing? If, they were, if there were groups of people, unbelievers, and our, our windows weren't, I don't know what you call that, um, clouded, pardon, frosted. If our windows weren't frosted and they were clear and there were groups of people looking into our windows, what would they see? Would they see a group of, of people walking in unity, a unified church, people who love the Lord, that have this vertical relationship, that they're just pursuing God with everything they have, and it's overflowing in this horizontal relationship through love and good works and all kinds of things like that? Or would they be seeing a reflection of themselves? You know, in a, a window, you look in a window, it can be like a mirror. So are they seeing a reflection of themselves and they're saying, well, they're no different than I am. Why, would I, why, why do I need that? Well, we want them to see something different, something that makes them thirsty. It's we're the soul of the earth. We should be making them thirsty, right? We're the light of the world. We should be shining away for them to eternal life with Jesus. But a lot of people, unfortunately, when they look inside the windows of the church world, they're just seeing a reflection. And the people are no different. They gossip, they murmur, they complain, they gripe. And outside of going to church on Sunday morning and maybe talking a certain type of language, they're not really any different. So why would I want that? And that's not what we want. We want a unified church that's passionately pursuing the Lord. I, I just think that's important. And I'm not going to get through all my notes today, and I won't keep you to take them. And that's okay. Harold, I don't need a text. I don't have my phone on me. So Harold Gingrich, don't need to text me and say finish. I can't because I just have too much information. But I think you're, get, you're, getting, you're getting what I'm saying. Just this unity is just really critical for us to really pay attention to. You know, in the, orig the origin of unity, it's interesting. I was reading something the other day, and, and they, they quoted the scripture, John 17, 22. And let's, we're not putting that up first. We're going to put Genesis 1, 26 up first on the screen. Uh, that's the first one on the list. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Right? According to, his like, to our likeness. And I don't need to read any more of that. Because that's just, that was maybe, I think, the, from the biblical perspective, that's the first definition of God said, let us. It's kind of interesting because we think God let us. But God in that 
word is the word Elohim, which is plural. God, and we know now the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. And there is part of the way that we're made like God is that you know that you are a tripartite being. It's a fancy word, tripartite, body, soul, spirit. You are also three in one, just like God is three in one. There's three parts of you, right? But that's, that, uh, I thought you can't go to John and say the origin of unity, but yet John 17, which we'll pull up and read next, is really a, a, a great message or great, this is Jesus during his high priestly prayer. This is just Jesus, the whole chapter is just Jesus praying. And it's a prayer that even impacts us today. And it says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Right? God, Jesus is praying, the glory that you, Father, gave me, I am giving to these who are following me, okay? That they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me. That they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know. Those people looking inside our windows. That they may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's a, that's a powerful scripture. Jesus prayed, and, and if we were to continue in that prayer, he's praying for those that they would be one. But he also says, a little later in that passage, he says, I don't just pray for those who are hearing me today, but those who will believe because of their testimony. That's praying for us. His high priestly prayer prayed for you and I to be one, to be in unity. So if Jesus prayed for us to be in unity, then it's possible for us to do this. And his prayer is powerful, and we need to allow his prayer to impact us and affect us. Because it's really, it's critical for us to do this. That I may be, that they may be one as you and I are one. That's something maybe in our corporate prayer time we need to even focus on. God, help us to be one. Help us to walk in unity. Help us to be one in spirit. And drop the agreeing on everything. Well, this person is, you know, um, and they don't like green. The kids were funny, right? Somebody said, one of the kids said, I like purple. They didn't want to say, I like green. They like purple. Oh, fine. Purple's your favorite color. Green can be someone else's favorite color. It's okay to be different. How about celebrating that a little bit? As opposed to, they just don't have very good taste. <laughs> that's what people have a tendency. That's what humans have a tendency to do. And if you don't do it my way, then you have to have, there has to be something wrong with them. Um, and it's not necessarily the case. It's okay. God made all kinds of colors made all of us different, and he did it on purpose. He gave us minds that think differently. Some of you are structured and, and organized, and some of us aren't, and it's okay. I love people who are structured and organized. It, I gave up trying to be. I let other people, if structure and organization is needed, then I bring someone in and say, help me to do this because I can't, and I don't even try. It's a waste of my time. And, and if we could do that with other things, that, that, that they do things differently, whatever, maybe you can learn some things. Unity, how is unity maintained? Here's a good question I wrote down. How is unity maintained? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. We're going to go through this and hit on the four points real quick out of this. It won't be real lengthy, but it'll be just enough for you to go, and then, and then we'll be done. This is just a great passage of Scripture. Paul. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, writing this from jail, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. That's, that's heavy, man. You have been called by God. You didn't just walk into this by yourself. God wooed you and called you into this walk with him. Always be humble and gentle. There's a great country song, and I don't listen to country anymore. I used to listen to some, but some of it just gets too messed up in the head, so I don't. But uh, Tim McGraw, son of baseball player from the Philadelphia Phillies, Tug McGraw, uh, sang a song, Always Be Humble and Kind. And the word gentle, a lot of times, is also translated as kind. Always be humble and kind. I think it's something he said his mother taught him. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. That's big, right? I can, I can, it's okay. Even if it's a fault, not just a difference, but it can be a fault because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit 
binding yourselves together in peace. And I have to look and say from the church perspective, have we done a good job making every effort? Now, this isn't just, once again, aimed at free grace. This is the church. Some of you have gone to other churches. I've been a part of a few different churches. Are we doing what that says in there in verse 3, making every effort to keep ourselves united in spirit, binding ourselves together with peace in spite of differences? Are we really making that effort? That's a good, but this, we're not going to dive into that. I just want you to think about that. But let's just break down. There's four key things in here. Humility, gentleness, patience, and love are kind of four words that really pop out of here. So we're going to look and just talk a couple things, read a couple passages of scripture, and I think it'll help, and then we'll wrap up, okay? So humility, spiritually bankrupt, the opposite of pride, okay? And, and you sit there and think spiritually bankrupt. Wait a minute. Just, Hold on. Let's read Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at first eight verses. We'll pop through here. It says, therefore, this once again, Paul writing, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, Consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. He bankrupted himself in a sense. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Jesus, the Son of God, left earth, left heaven, highest of highs, and came down to the lowliest of lows. And not only did he come down in the form of man, he took on the attitude of being a servant. He demonstrated that. One way he demonstrated that was when he washed the disciples' feet. He took on the, the role of a servant. And he demonstrated that something we should be doing. And think about that. If we all went into thinking about being a servant as opposed to making sure it's done my way, but being a servant to other people, laying down, your, emptying yourselves, emptying your ideas sometimes. And you know the thing that when you do this stuff, the Bible says give and it will be given. There's something, there's a principle there that when we do something to see that someone else is lifted up as opposed to myself, then God chooses to lift me up. Pride goes before destruction, the Bible says. And if I keep fighting to get my way because I'm too proud to lower myself to the role of a servant and let someone else be lifted up in their ideas, the thing about humility is that God turns towards the humble in spirit. But he resists the proud. It's a key in unity. It's a really big deal for us. And Jesus demonstrated this for us. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. That's number one. That's that first humble. And humble is interesting. You know, I joked a little bit, you know, on Wednesday night because I talked just a tiny little bit about this. Um, and I said, you know, I, you know, did you know I wrote a book? You know, the 10 most humble people in the world and how I found the other nine. <laughs> Hopefully you realize that was a joke. I didn't write a book, but that's not humility, right? You know, I'm the most humble person I know. <laughs> you might not be <laughs> if you think like that. Hum humility is something that other people would say about you. It's not something you say about yourself. You need to learn. We need to learn to walk in humility and all these things, but it's not something for us to self-proclaim. Gentleness is that second word, and, and it's a great picture, bridled strength. Jesus was gentle, but man, I tell you what, don't mess with Jesus. I mean, read Revelation and learn about Jesus. That, the, the book of Revelation isn't just a revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the actual title, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's a bad man. I don't mean bad. That, you know, I mean bad is good, but you don't want to mess with Bridled strength. Think of a horse. A horse is a powerful, powerful animal. But when, when a man in a healthy way takes a horse and kind of breaks it, I think that's one of the terms they use, but 
gets it to the point. What a what an incredible strength that you have. It's bridled, but it's it can be used to its fullest, right? That's that's gentleness isn't just this oh everything, you know, wimpy, weak. Oh, just have to be gentle and kind. No, man, there's something, there's a strength. When when we read about gentleness in the Bible, it's a strength. And like I said, a horse, like I said, is really powerful. But when it's bridled, man, it can be, it's controlled in everything. So that's what we want. We want this strength, but we want it to be bridled by the Lord. Christ's life is our example for this, right? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Here's what it says out of the New Living Translation. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Jesus was humble and gentle and you see that right in there. But like I said, it's not a weakness. It's not a acquiesce and, and everyone else is better. It, that's the different. When I consider you as better than myself, that's not me being weak. That's me being strong. That's me allowing God to work in my life because I'm allowing him to work in me. Patience is the next word. Boy, we could spend a long time on patience. You know, you stay the course despite circumstances. You know, you're on a trip. You got to go somewhere. Something happens. You get the map out. Or now the GPS, you navigate around problems. You, you learn different. Now the GPS sometimes does that stuff automatically. Hey, there's a shorter way or faster way to go because there's trouble ahead. And that's great when it does that. But patience is something that I, can't, I wish I could spend a little more time on. But it's a struggle that we all have to be patient. You know, when that offense comes, and I talked about from 2 Samuel chapter 10, Go to Jericho. Do you think those guys wanted to sit and wait? Man, you got to believe that these guys, they, they, they were probably pretty strong men. That They weren't servants, lowly, humble, weak, wimpy people that Jesus sent to do what he did. They were probably some of his mighty men that may have gone in and done that. Imagine going, wait until your beard grows back. And we talked last. How long does it take? I, I forget. I asked Alex Straub how long it took him. I think he said about four months to grow his beard. And, and I know it takes a while. Some people it takes longer than others. Uh, but it's hard to wait. It's hard to be patient. Psalm 46, and I had this in here without even realizing that we were going to show Anita today. Uh, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Wait. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. I read that scripture to you last week out of Isaiah. I think it's 40, 31. Um, it's just that. It, it's, it's a big deal. Christ's life is our example. We remain steadfast, just like Christ, waiting for rep recompense, waiting for him to do his thing, waiting for him to work in our lives. Hebrews 10, 13, I don't have this for up here, but waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Man, we just like to crush everything right away, but we're in this process. There's a lot of things going on. Country attacking another country. And, and you know, there's these things that are just not good in the world. We know, but the Bible tells us there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Well, there are rumors and there is actually a war going on right now. We know that. But our job is to wait. Be patient. Keep going. Keep loving him and, and serving him and chasing him with everything we've got in all our energy and letting that overflow into our horizontal world. And then there's love. Looking beyond the action, the motive and the expression, and seeing an image bearer of God that he sent his son to die for. This is something my wife would tell me many different times. You've got to stop seeing them through your own eyes and see them like Jesus sees them. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that a few times from you. When you start asking God, when you have a problem with someone, some offense comes through somebody, or you, whatever you're offended, or, or, or whatever, just difference in personalities, and, and whatever the case is, just remember that that person is someone that Jesus came to die for. And it changes the way you'll act towards them if you do that first. That's a big think. A big thing that you've got to do is Jesus loves them just as much as he loves me. And why would I not do the same? That's, that's the overflow part. If I get that, that Jesus loves you and, and you're somebody he died for too, then how can I harbor anger and bitterness or envy or anything else in my heart towards you? You can't if you really get this right because love won't allow it. You fill yourself with love and love will push those things out of your life. 
Christ's commandment is our standard. John chapter 13, verses 34, 35. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Interesting, right? He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, might, strength. Love others as you love yourself. And now he says, a new commandment I give you to love one another. Someday we'll have to break that down and teach on that because it's a pretty cool teaching and, and something to learn there. A new commandment I give you as I have loved you. I, I think that's the new. The, I, I, that you love one another and then back, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I think that's a difference. And they were told to love one another. Now he demonstrated it. And if you do it like I do, you're going to get it right. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Back to the people looking in the windows. If they see that, they're not seeing a reflection anymore. Now they're looking and seeing something different. And now they have something there saying, man, maybe I want that. Maybe they don't know they want it or need it. But if they look and they see something and they're hungry, we'll see something different as opposed to reflection and not seeing anything else different because they're not loving as Jesus told us to love. That's a big deal. I'm going to stop there, so let's stand. God's work is never finished in you and me until we take our last breath and then instantly we get become in his presence and we know all things and we get to walk like Adam and Eve walked in the garden of Eden without sin in the presence of the Lord forever. But as we walk in this earth, opportunities for offenses, it's impossible that, impossible that they won't come. We know that. They're going to come. What are you going to do with them? Those things. Guard your heart. But this unity is something that we are commanded to walk in community, in unity. Community. Unity is a part of that. Common unity, right? Come, somebody put that together. Community. Common unity. Boy, the common is God, man. It's just like that group when I rode my Harley and I, people would talk to me that would never talk to me before. I would never talk to them. Even in a greater way, this common unity happens because of the, this common denominator that we all have in our lives. Jesus Christ changes everything. As he has loved us, we must love others. He, no, there's no do as I say, not as I do with Jesus. In the church world sometimes, do as I say, not as I do. No one actually says that, but you get that because people say it, but they're not doing it. And that's, that can't be us. We do, we do what Jesus did. We say what Jesus said. We love like Jesus loved. That's the key. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And I just pray that you just help us to do this. And we saw scriptures where it very clearly talks about it. To be one is you prayed for us to be one. And then the scripture teaches us that we're supposed to walk in unity. And head in the same direction, hand in hand. So I pray you help us do that, Lord. As free grace first, you know, right here individually. And as free grace. And even expanding out into the other... The, all the Christians that are in this valley, Lord, that we would walk hand in hand with and stop disputing our petty differences. Just help us just to love as you loved. And Lord, if there's things that are blocking or getting in the way, I pray that you just show us as we examine ourselves. As we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sinned against us. I pray that you would show us how to forgive. Teach us who we need to forgive and how to do that. So help us to walk out of here today different today, Lord, in knowing that there's something, that, a goal for us. There's, a, there's, a, there's this target for us to aim at. And we don't want to miss that in sin. We want to hit that target that you've painted out there so clearly to walk as one, as you and the Father are one. To so go with us today, I just speak peace over every household that's represented here. Peace in the home, peace in body. Peace in the sick, anyone who's struggling with any sickness or, or, or anything that's going on in their body, that there would just be your peace would just rest on them. I love when you said, Jesus, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you and give you. And I pray that same thing right now, your peace, Lord, let it just rest here on everybody as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. And something I forget a lot of times, guys, is to thank you for your giving, but... 
I know most of you, probably all of you know this, there are boxes, two out each of these doors, one of each of these doors and one at the main entrance for your offering. Thank you for, thank you for your faithfulness and giving. We greatly appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day.